Welcome back to Black News Tonight. We continue our discussion about the first black police chief of Minneapolis retiring over the weekend. But this time, we would like to expand the discussion across the nation and unpack the new pattern of urban cities appointing black police chiefs. Joining me now is Corey Pegues. He is the retired NYPD executive and the author of Once a Cop and the star of a new documentary, A Cop and Robber's Story. So thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. So I got to start off with asking you, uh, you know, we're hearing what's going on with these cops uh, now being appointed to these urban areas. What do you think of that? And do you think it is a good strategy? Well, if I may, can I just make a quick comment on your last segment? It sure. was almost a love fest for the chief, the police chief, mm -hmm. who was there for less than probably two years, two and a half, six, eight police involved shootings, six people murdered by the cops, and one was a national murder that probably is going to change policing for the near future. Um, it wasn't, it was, it's not a love fest for me because I'm inside a police department. I understand that person is a scholar. Uh, for me, for him to allow Officer Chauvin to be on patrol was the biggest mistake of his career. Because there's no way in the world that somebody with over 21 complaints was involved in one police killing should be on the streets training cops. I just, I, I just had to put that out there. Mm. I don't think it should be a love fest for him. I'm actually happy that he's on his way and out of policing. So do you think he'll have a legacy that is slanted toward more positive there? Do you think he did anything to help the community and the department while he was there? He probably did some subtle things, but the bag that he has to hold is George Floyd. Mm. And he must be pressed on him being in charge and allowing an officer, a rogue officer, to train young cops. The poor two cops that's getting ready to go on trial, the young cops, I mean, what was they going to do with somebody with 20-something mm -hmm. years? Um, you know, that's just policing. The rookie's not going to ever challenge the veteran, which is something that has to change. But that veteran with such a tainted record should have never been on the streets. Mm. All right, well, now I want to move on to talk about other people that are put in these positions. Do you think that it is a beneficial strategy to have black officers? We had a black officer in that case in Minneapolis, and George Floyd was still killed by someone who sh should not have been serving on the police force. So do you think they're doing enough if they are put in these positions? Or is the system so, holding them against oh, them? So f for me, I'm so off the black white issue, the the color issue. I just want I just want police officers just come to the community and respect us. If it's a green cop we, and they have respect in our community, I think that's what people want. We just want a sense of safety because I can name 100 black cops that I've worked with. I don't want them coming to my house, but I could name 100 white cops. I want them the first one to knock on my door. So I'm so far off the, the black and white issue. We just need good leaders that's going to come into these police departments and revamp them and change isn't easy you have to come in you have to have a clear conscience to treat all the communities exactly the same and hold the cops feet to the fire because in all of these instances where there's they end up being a death the only person with a hundred thousand dollars worth of training is the cop so if it's black or white i'm expecting for that person to make clear and decisive decisions when they get ready to engage, especially with the use of daily physical force. Mm, and that's so important. So for you yourself, you went from being a drug dealer to serving as a decorated NYPD officer, a journey that you vividly describe in your book, Once a Cop. So give us some on the ground perspective here to who is better to serve in these communities of color. Is it a person that may live in that community? Is it a person that can identify more closely with the culture in that community? Who can help? Yeah, you hit it right on the nose, uh, that second piece you said. I believe that they should be hiring from within because, you know, you have some police departments like in the NYPD. Some of these cops live 75 miles away from the precinct in which they work so they can come to the come to the work, cause chaos, and leave. That's why I'm an advocate for residency requirement for at least the first five years of your career because you have to eat, sleep, and drink with the people. You go to Pathmark, you might see a, um, you know, one of the criminals that you see on the street. Your kids got to go to school with them. You got to get the cops to live, feel, and smell the community for at least five years, and then they will respect the community because they can see that some of the social economic issues are out of the citizens' control and that they just live there. But there's a lot of good people in these neighborhoods. And right now, I want to bring in Dr. Lorenzo Boyd to join this conversation, too. He is a professor of criminal justice and community policing at the University of New Haven. Thank you so much for joining this conversation. 
Thank you for having me. First, I want to get your perspective on this policing being done by black police officers. Do you think that it helps to have people in power at these police stations, stations the highest as the chief, involved in what's going on in these police stations to actually bring about change? Absolutely. I think having black police chiefs definitely adds to it. But that's not the panacea. That's not the only answer, because we're not talking about individuals. We're talking about changing a 400-year culture in this country. So adding just black police chiefs alone is not going to do it. But we absolutely need to hear from the black chiefs and hear from their perspectives. So what steps do you think cities can take to regain some type of control and police reform that would make the cities, and especially the urban communities, a safer place where people aren't fearing for their lives from the people that are supposed to protect and serve them? Well, we need to, instead of talking about reimagining policing, we need to actually reimagine training. Because the way police officers are trained, the us versus them mentality, the every call could be your last call, I think that's hugely problematic because the vast majority of police officers go through their day and are never harmed or hurt by the community at all. We need cultural competence in policing. And I spend my time going all over the country training police departments, trying to get police officers to understand the vicarious trauma in communities of color. Once they understand that, then I think they can start to better police them. So, Corey, what are some of the attributes we could look at for some of the future cops we should be hiring? I mean, no one may have thought you would be able to be a cop with your past as a drug dealer, someone who, you know, a lot is a lot alike at that time, people that were in the system and the type of person the police were trying to catch, but you became a decorated police officer. I think those people should not be overlooked. What type of characteristics should we be looking for? I think that we should get rid of that rule that if someone like was hanging around convicted felons or actually was convicted 25, 30 years ago and they actually changed their life. I mean, I am the embodiment of somebody that had that lifestyle and, you know, but they want to forget 47 years of my life and lock me into five years. And if I did, you know, if that's what they did, then, you know, I wouldn't be nothing. I'd be out in the street still doing the same thing. So I think we should give them a chance. Now, I'm not saying let's go on record and hire every convicted felon, but you have to drill these investigations down to pick the right person. But if you have impediments, it's going to it's, it's not going to help you picking the right type of people to come into the police department. Mm. And I think better police community relations is a huge part of this to create that atmosphere where people aren't afraid of the police and police know that they're there to protect and serve them. Because I think a lot of times what happens in these situations is that they are afraid and they're making split decisions based off the fear that they live with every day and the assumptions that they're making about a people that they're not, not connected to. So and, and leaving this, I want to ask both of you what can be done and moving forward to help make real systematic change within police systems across the country. Dr. Boyd, I'll start with you. I would start, first of all, with police academies. There are some police academies across the country. At my alma mater, Northeastern University, they do a lot of stuff where on Friday afternoons, the academy stops and they assign police officers to the community. And if you do that for two, three, four months, you want police officers to have a relationship with the community in a non-enforcement way. The more you spend time with the people in the community, the more you become the community, the easier it's going to be. But you can't just drive in from another city 50 miles away and then harm the community and then drive out, think there are no repercussions. Mm -hmm. We want people to be part of the community. So true. Corey? Yeah, well, you know, like the doctor says, you know, in the last two years, we've been talking about reimagining, restructuring police. And I think one of the first things we need to do is get rid of qualified immunity. Qualified immunity is driving a stake between the, the citizens and the police department because the citizens are thinking that the cops are getting away pretty much with murder. And there's yeah. other things that protect cops, such as the Fourth Amendment, unreasonable mm -hmm. search and seizure, indemnification. They're pretty much indemnified, but they threw this qualified immunity out. If you get rid of qualified immunity, it'll be such a more harmonious relationship because the plaintiffs will now have their dead in court. They can go to court and plead their case, but the cops are covering themselves with qualified immunity. Mm, and a national database of wrongful firings or firings that were negative towards the community, things like that. So we can have a database that keeps track of all the mishaps that these police officers are involved in, killings that they're involved in. And then maybe we won't see some of the problems we have now and get rid of some of those bad cops that are on the street.
So thank you both so much for joining us and joining this conversation. We appreciate your time.